now I have the pleasure of introducing a very special guest. He was here in 2010 to receive the King Vidor Award, and it was presented to him by his friend James Cromwell. He fortunately enjoyed the experience so much that he asked me, and I kind of surpri was surprised whether he could come back and present an award in the future. And we've talked about it over the years, and, and he hasn't been available, but this year, fortunately, he was, and fortunately, we found someone perfect for him to present the award to as well. So we are delighted that he's made the effort to be here to pay tribute to his pal and colleague, Ann Margaret. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the amazing Alan Arkin. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, don't laugh at me. Uh, am I the only person in the county that's got a tie on? It's, uh, <laughs> uh, should I take it off? <laughs> Annie, I'm going to leave it on for you. I, I'm the only person that's allowed to call her Annie, and she doesn't hit me. How do you define Ann Margaret? When she burst upon the scene in the early 60s, she was much too beautiful to be taken seriously as a brilliant actress, which is what she, what she, what she was. Because to be a great actress, it's OK to look interesting, but you don't want to be gorgeous. You need a couple of physical challenges, limitations, or liabilities. With Anne Margaret, go find one. <laughs> also, to be a great actress, you're probably not going to be a very good dancer. Anne Margaret dances like the wind. Watching her is like watching a joyous fortress of nature, free and imaginative, and you can't take your eyes off her. Now, to be a great dancer, that probably means you won't sing too well. For example, Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly, so you forgive them their singing. But Anne Margaret sings like a bird. So what do you do with someone who's brilliant at everything she does? What do you call them? Well, they didn't know what else to call her, so they called her a sex kitten. <laughs> in spite of the fact that she's been married to Roger Smith for 50 years, so go figure. <laughs> There's no way to pigeonhole Anne Margaret or ignore her prodigious talent, which spills over in so many areas. Also, when you have the rarity of someone who's brilliant at everything they touch, particularly in this business, you expect them to be at least a little bit temperamental, perhaps difficult, maybe even impossible. Anne Margaret is as easy to be with as anyone you could ever hope to meet. She is kind, she is generous, she is unassuming, she is hysterically funny and as modest as she can be. But in case you think she's without faults altogether, I'm going to rat on her just a bit. <laughs> Sorry, A.M. We need, yeah. <laughs> She said, no, you're not. <laughs> it's true, I'm not. I don't, care. I don't give a damn. We need the whole truth. The last time we worked together, which was last year, we, had, we were standing in a market in front of uh, vegetables. She nudged me. What is that, she said, and she pointed to something purple. It's an eggplant, I said. The woman has never seen an eggplant. In her entire life, she had never seen an eggplant. So you see, she's not perfect. <laughs> but in, in every other way, she's a complete joy. She has won five Golden Globes. She's received two Oscar nominations. And I repeat, she's been married to her husband, Roger Smith, for 50 years. Don't tell anybody. It's, in this business, it's a liability. It is a great honor that I am here to pay tribute to this artist, and this lovely human being, Anne Margaret. Uh, uh, right now, before, before, before we meet her, she's actually, she, she might be here in person. Uh, before we meet her, we're going to see some of her wonderful work. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anne Margaret.
you knew you were going to have to be up here. On behalf of the San Luis Obispo Film Festival, we'd like to present you with this beautiful award. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, oh my gosh. Thank you so much. You know, I didn't know that all those film clips were going to be shown. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Alan Arkin, um, we just completed uh, our second film together. It's called uh, Going in Style, and it's Alan and uh, Morgan Freeman and Michael Caine. And he plays Albert, and I play Annie. And we get married at the end of the film. I know. <laughs> well, Suzanne, uh, his wife is here, and uh, <laughs> he's a bigamist. <laughs> I just, I have to say this, that was so beautiful what you said, thank you. Thank you, oh, God bless you. I, I have to tell you, um, he's weird. The man is weird, he talks weird, he, he walks weird, he acts weird, he's weird. And I said that in front of Suzanne, and she thought about it a minute, and she said, you know, he's uniquely weird. <laughs> yeah, great. I am so thrilled to be here. and. Thank you for uh, inviting me, Wendy, um, Edson, spelled E-I-D-S-O-N. Uh, I, you guys are <laughs> incredible. I feel so welcome, I really do. Thank you very, very much. Oh my gosh. Uh, and when I was told that I was going to give the uh, George Sidney Award, I, uh, he was one of my mentors. Um, I did Bye Bye Birdie and Viva Las Vegas with him, and uh, bless his soul. And the other gentleman who was a mentor was Mr. George Burns. And oh, I love those two guys. Um, I just thank you again so very much. Thank you. Now, if you have a television set uh, and you like movies, you'll know who this man is, Mr. Ben Mankwitz. Yes. Yes. Is it working now? this. Yes. There we go. All right, we're in business. Thank you. I come with a lot of props. <laughs> First of all, your uh, autobiography. Uh-huh. Very nice, 1994. Uh-huh. I like it very much. Oh, good. If I can, I'd like to read something from it. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, trapped, dear. victimized by your own words. Um, so you didn't know they were going to play that, that montage? I did not. <sighs> Um, boy, oh boy, so many memories. Well, oh, good. Goodness. Well, let's let's talk about a couple of those. Uh, there was one movie there that I was uh, unaware of, <laughs> and uh, as I'm, I'm a host, by the way, at the Turner Classic Movies, and and my job is to uh, and uh, 
by the way, I did at any point ever in my life, I would think, yeah, and then later you'll go to San Luis Obispo and Alan Arkin will introduce you so you can interview Ann Margaret. <laughs> that was not a scenario I saw playing out. Um, but the villain with Schwarzenegger? I, I don't think we've aired that. Um, what, uh, did you sense you were working with the future governor of California in that movie? <laughs> I just think it was so funny um, in that movie because he had such a, well, he still has such a great physique. And uh, all he wore was that, you know, light blue shirt. Um, he's, he's wonderful. <laughs> he's wonderful. Um, uh, I don't know where to start, but I'll, I'll start because you mentioned George Burns. And so uh, for those who don't know, uh, George Burns, in many ways, I think you would have found your way to stardom anyway, but he very much pushed it along, didn't he? He discovered me, yes. How, how would you uh, tell that story? Okay. I cannot remember the name of the studio where I went, and um, I had these... Well, that summer, I didn't have a heck of a lot of money, and I had about three outfits, and this was one of them. Some a black, shiny, because I had worn so much, pair of Toreador pants, and a light blue lamb's wool sweater. And um, I had my long, dark brown hair halfway down my back. And um, I did a couple of songs. And he says, hey, Eddie, <laughs> do you want to come with me, do a show with me in Vegas? Yes, I do. I'd love to. Um, so we went to the Sahara Hotel, and uh, it was the last time that the Ames brothers uh, were together. Um, just, I was, there were like five acts, and I, I was one of them. And we did uh, what he calls a, you know, he was from vaudeville and a, a, a sand dance. And every time he uh, took some sand out of his pocket and strewed it. <laughs> uh, uh, what am I trying to say? He put all this sand in front of us. And we did, you know, through the sand. Ain't got nobody. Nobody. Oh, he was great. And and what I, what I one of the things that I that I got from reading your, your book is that is that it's not he didn't he didn't, you know, you were what, 17, 18? You were really young. I was young. 18, yes. Yeah. And, and he didn't just discover this, this beautiful, talented newcomer and then forget about it because he had other things to do. When you made a movie that was not in that montage that I liked quite a bit for John Frankenheimer in 1986 mm -hmm. with Roy Scheider, a movie called 52 Pickup, um, he, uh, Elmer. yeah, and Elmore Leonard adaptation, a good one. Um, he called you after that and said, Come back! Don't stop! Don't you can make movies, but you still need to be live, and you still need to be doing shows. And that's 27 years later. George Burns still sort of looking out for you. I guess that's what mentors do. Uh, every um, Christmas, I would go and give him and Gracie a Christmas present at their home. Uh, I think on Maple. And uh, oh, I mean, when we were uh, when we were rehearsing our thing, the the I ain't got nobody. We rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed at his home, at their home, and the last person to see it was Gracie. She came down the stairs, and she was the one who made the decision. And when Gracie said yes, then we did it. <laughs> she well, was so beautiful. <clears throat> Let me uh, so. Not long after that, you get your first movie role, and you're cast in Pocket Full of Miracles. You've, you haven't made a movie before, and all of a sudden, you're, you're working for Frank Capra. Oh, yes. And who was the star of Pocket Full of Miracles? Who's, whose Betty, daughter did you play? Betty Davis. <laughs> it was just incredible. I had never taken any acting lessons. I had done musical comedy in, in high school, um, and 
I didn't know what, what a, a close-up, a medium shot, or a long shot. And I just, oh, I just prayed that I would remember my lines. And I was doing a scene with Miss Davis. And all of a sudden, she came up to me. And she looked at me, and she said, and Margaret, this is your close-up. I want you to look the very best that you possibly can. Make up hair! <laughs> so in a Frank Capra movie, she cut the scene. You guys were rolling, <laughs> and she stopped it. Yes. Now, one can imagine, we all have ideas of what Betty Davis was like. Oh. She... And it's not the woman who always looked out for the incredibly beautiful young actresses who were working in her movies, but, but that's exactly what she did. She, oh, um... The opening scene when, when you first see me and Peter, mm -hmm. uh, she was sitting down, like, well, it was way up, up here. I was, and she, when I came back, she said, it reminded me so much of me and my mother. That's yeah. really nice. Yeah. I just like the idea of Betty Davis cutting Frank Capper's scene, <laughs> te telling, telling you to go get uh, hair and makeup, then coming back, inspecting you, and then saying, all right, we can shoot now. Okay, we can yeah. shoot. Now. Um, uh, one of my favorite movies, one of the best gambling movies uh, ever made, uh, we saw a clip of there, The Cincinnati Kid. Mm. Um, uh, from uh, Norman Jewison, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, now, Steve McQueen, and you could hear it in the audience here, as soon as they saw McQueen, it was like this, you know, this uh, energy surge went oh, through yes. the audience. Oh, yeah. And it's men and women. We're all like, oh, hey, Steve McQueen. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you were still very early in your career. This is, uh, I think, 63, I think, and you would, uh, 65, I guess, for, 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 but you were early on. What was, uh, if you weren't intimidated working with Betty Davis, I imagine you weren't intimidated, even though that cast, Carl Malden, Steve McQueen, Tuesday Well, this is, uh, these are serious, serious actors. Well, when I met him, uh, we had this love of motorcycles, which I still do. Uh, and the... <laughs> Yeah, Lavender Harley with daisies all around. Really girly bike. Um, and what was it? MGM was giving me a hard time because I was very young and I was single and I was on a motorcycle coming to work. And they got real nervous. And I couldn't understand why they did. So I said to Steve, um, what am I going to do? He said, oh, let them worry. That's their job. <laughs> so I just want people to understand, these are like high-powered negotiations where they don't, they don't tell you we'd like you to not ride the motorcycle. They tell you you can't ride the motorcycle, which is the same thing they told to Steve McQueen. <laughs> and his reaction was, yes. his, his, his advice from the veteran in the film industry was, eh, yeah, yeah, F him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, he didn't say that. He <laughs> No, no, he never swore around me. The, um, but you, but, so you continued to ride? Yes. Where did that love of motorcycles come from? Uh, I was telling the Arkans uh, last night. I was born in Sweden, and when I was eight months old, um, we, we moved to a little town called Valshabin, where mother was born. And we lived with my mom and her mother, Muma, and my uncle, Kale. And uh, mother and I always used to harmonize. And uh, when Muma was so tired from working, and uncle Kale uh, played the accordion. And um, uncle Kale had a beautiful, beautiful motorcycle. And he would take me for rides on it. You were eight months old? Oh, no, that's right. No, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. No. Say, we need to investigate no, Uncle Kyle. No, no, Kyle. no, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. When I was eight months, <laughs> Daddy went to America because he, he was such a gypsy. Um, he wanted to see the new world. And it was during World War II, and Daddy was just... He said it was much too dangerous for us to cross the ocean. And so um, five years later, 
is when Daddy said that we could come. Um, but what I wanted to see, so I was like five years old. Still. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Uncle Kyla took me for, we, Volshabin now has 98 people. Really? Yes. And I was there two years ago. And, and it's, when Mother and I left, there was 160. Now it's 98 people. Wow. What well, was that like going home? It was unbelievable. It was surreal. It was so bittersweet because Mother and Daddy uh, are not here anymore. I mean, they're here in my heart and my, my brain, my head. But um, we stayed at the house that I left when I was five years old. It's incredible. You, um, you know, a lot of people, of course, have, uh, many of us, I, I'm incredibly close to my father. He died about a year and a half ago. So I, I relate to when you write about your parents. But your relationship with your parents was remarkable because you became a, a big star, a huge star, one of the biggest stars in the world. And you still, even in 1973, we saw that clip of the train robbers. For you, it was still impolite to refer to John Wayne as anything other than Mr. Wayne, because your parents yes, told sir. you that's how to, that's how you talk to people. Yes, sir. <laughs> I couldn't call him Duke. I mean, because you know all of his old friends, like Robert Mitchum and everybody, they were calling him Duke. But there's no way that I could do that. So what did you call him? Did you call him Mr. Wayne? I just, I didn't say anything, actually, because I didn't know what to say. Just said, hi. <laughs> <laughs> he was so wonderful to uh, my parents. Um, this was 1973. You were, uh, the movie was shot then in, in 72. Yes. Um, because you were nominated for your first Oscar in 71, uh, for the movie in 71, and then the nominations in 72 for Carnal right. Knowledge. Right. So... So it's just, it's, it's remarkable to note your, I don't know, your reticence in embracing your celebrity fully, that here you are, you've got an Oscar nomination, and you're still worried about being respectful to John Wayne. And now, I get that, because for crying out loud, it's, it's, it's John Wayne. Um, but he uh, embraced you fully. You were the only woman in the movie, right? I think so. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, the uh, well, there weren't a lot of them, but so in in so then you in, you get nominated for Carnal Knowledge, and Ben Johnson, who was also in The Train Robbers, gets nominated for Last Picture Show, Bogdanovich, and how do you get to the Oscar ceremony from from shooting? Oh boy, you really did your homework. <laughs> wow, wow, you're great. Um, well. John Wayne uh, let us have his uh, jet, and Ben and I went to the Oscars, and, and of course, Roger, and he got the award, and I didn't, so we got back on the same plane and went back to Durango, Mexico. And then what happened when you got back, and Ben Johnson comes back an Oscar winner, and, and you lost, I think, to Cloris... Leachman. Yes, right. Um, so what did, uh, how did John Wayne deal with that? Oh, he just, oh, he just embraced me, and I don't even know what he said. I don't know. Well, what he, he said was, I mean, I won't quote you on you, but it was incredibly nice, and basically it was. What did he say? I mean, these awards are <laughs> nonsense. There are much bigger things for you. You're a giant star, none of this matters. And really? Yeah, that's right. I, I, I... Yeah. Wow. I mean, of course, he was wrong. The Oscars are everything, <laughs> but... Uh, oh, my gosh. Um, uh, look, I'm, gonna, I'm jumping around, but your first experience at the Oscars was... You were nominated twice. You were nominated again, Best Actress for, for Tommy, the movie that, that, that people who will, would be wise to stay and see tonight. But what... Um, uh, uh, you performed at the Oscars, right? I remember very well. I knew six months before 
Six that, months? Six months before that I was going to be doing uh, Bachelor in Paradise. And I was just so nervous. You were 20, I think. I think yeah. I was really young. Um, so I rehearsed it, rehearsed it. Night and day I rehearsed it. Um, and when I got there, I was holding on to the, when they were calling my name, I was holding on to the curtain, and all of a sudden, this little guy waddled up, and he called himself the Incredible Imposter. The Incredible Imposter? Uh, you know, he, mm, you know what, what I'm talking about, right? The man, catch me, was it catch me if you can? What was his name? Oh, the actual guy? Yeah. The, the, Leo, the, the guy Leonardo DiCaprio played in the movie? It was this little guy <laughs> who kept, and, and I was all ready to go on, and he just went up there. <laughs> yeah, and said he was who he was, and then left. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was... Um, and you'd been rehearsing for six months for six this month. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it was Vince Edwards... And um, Shelly, Shelly Winters, yes. And it was like, no one knew what to do. He just waddled right back. <laughs> <laughs> it was just weird. Uh, of course, your, uh, your parents were there for that? Yes, they sure were. It seems like that they were there for just pretty much every important moment in your life. Always. I'm the only child. Yeah, but there are a lot of only children who don't have that relationship with their parents. Oh, incredible. There's some people here in the audience that knew them very well. Yeah. You know, I want to I share one story about Anne margaret we, we met last year at the TCM Film Festival at the end of uh, last year. I think it was in April, almost a year ago, basically. And, you know, uh, Alan Arkin was introducing... And Margaret, and is a two-time Oscar winner, and this you know, Grammys, and you know, and, and uh, one of the biggest stars of her generation, and that sort of you know never acted like a big star. But we were late to one interview. You probably don't even know this uh, because you uh, you held us up. But the, but the reason <laughs> hold on, <laughs> the reason you held us up is because as we were walking into the theater, there were there was one one old one and one new motorcycle parked out there. Oh. Yeah. And so we were like, everybody was like, oh, we're late, we're late, we're late. And as we were like, she's Caroline, and she was like, I'm it! <laughs> uh, and you stopped, oh, and yeah. you, uh, you, you like caressed, and you know, <laughs> there, was a, there was intimacy happening with this uh, strange but beautiful motorcycle. Do, uh, you mentioned, you still ride? Well, I was talking to the Arkans about it uh, last night. Um, I've got this beautiful lavender Harley, and it's uh, it was painted for me. Oh God, it's gorgeous with with little white daisies on it, and um, Roger gets extremely nervous, so I have yeah. not ridden it All for right, well. a while. But I'm not gonna sell it. He sold his, but I ain't gonna sell mine. But you've had some uh, you've had some real accidents. Oh yes. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Have I ever? I think it was Brainerd, Minnesota. Brainerd, Minnesota. That's right. Yeah. I was riding uh, my bike, and just with a whole bunch of people, and all of a sudden uh, there was some white sand there, and uh, just took me. Took me away, and uh, but you and I landed into into a bunch of stones, just I don't know, black stones. I don't know what what it was. Uh, stones that broke your ribs. That's what we'll refer to yeah. them as. <laughs> um, and so I was just you know, I, 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 you've had these significant. You had the accident there in Brainerd. You you the fall off the stage in Tahoe sounds terrifying in seventy two. Um, you, these don't, uh, these things don't, they don't get in your way. No. No. Well, you have to, 
you know, it was the sixth time that I had uh, done that show. It was the second show was after midnight. And uh, everything had gone fine. But there were supposed to be two gentlemen. All right, let me put this down. Yeah, this is no disrespect. No, I just no, it's, uh, by the way, this is this is heavy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is fifty. This is eight pounds. It's, this is a thing. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I entered the stage, twenty-two feet up on a platform, and there were two gentlemen. One for the front of the um, the platform, and one gentleman for the back. And I didn't realize, and we all didn't realize, uh, that if it was beyond six inches, it would tip over. And it was beyond six inches. And it went. Yeah. But it was great because I didn't know anything. For three days, I was... You were in a coma. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It wasn't a little accident. You were in a coma. No. You could have died. No. no. Well, okay. Well... <laughs> no. But I'm not sure the doctors would agree. Usually no. a coma is a sign of no. something. I'm not a doctor, but I watch ER a lot. And <laughs> I'm pretty sure a coma was dangerous. No. no uh, I realized something was really wrong when I finally woke up. I couldn't move. couldn't move my mouth. I broke my jaw. I broke five bones here. And... I think it was my shoulder, but they said, put, well, you know, wires between of the foot here and there. Norma, do you remember? <laughs> my friend Norma is here, and uh, people didn't realize I had to have, like, um, a liquid roast beef. Oh, that sounds, that's good. Yeah, they serve it, that on airplanes now. No, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> no it's, it, it smelled like roast beef. Ugh, but, I think that makes it worse. But you know what? I, I lost so much weight. <laughs> I lost 15 pounds. Yeah. It's a heck of a way to do right. it. Though. All you got to do is fall 20 feet off a stage in Lake Tahoe. It's the, it's the best diet the Americans can yes. offer, right? But Dr. Oz how... will be promoting it soon. <laughs> well, I have to... My husband, after I had that fall came in and, well, Roger explained what had happened to me when, when I woke up and couldn't sleep. He came with this. Oh. He designed this. <laughs> Nothing ever hurt. <laughs> Nothing. Diamonds <laughs> are better than Darvon. <laughs> You remember that, you guys, with your, your ladies. <laughs> so all you got to do is risk serious injury, you lose weight, and you get a diamond. <laughs> it's a great plan. The, um, uh, we we got to go soon, but I want to ask you about another injury. <laughs> um, uh, because it, another one? Well, Tommy. Oh. Right? Because they're going to see it uh, uh, oh. tonight. So I think it's relevant. I wasn't going to ask you about that. But I, I didn't know we were going to see Tommy tonight. So there, you uh, you punched a television, right? Didn't you cut your hand on a television? You got like thirty stitches, something. It was bad. You're apparently uh, super injury prone. That's no, what I. Yeah. No, I do a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, that's well. All right, all right, fair enough. I do lots of things. No, this was. I threw a champagne bottle right, yeah. into a TV set, and. What happened then? Um, oh, and all the soap suds were there. That's right. I was like a guinea pig. Yeah, that's right. I, I yeah. had all this. They hadn't tried it on anybody. Those <laughs> beans coming down. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what was <laughs> going to happen. And I just was thrown. And, uh, okay, so the soap suds were coming up and up and up. And all of a sudden I saw pink. And then I saw... They had remembered the glass, the broken bla uh, glass, everywhere except Ken Russell, the director. You know, it was cra crazy. It was crazed and glazed. Um, that's it shows. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so he wanted me to get closer. and cl He was on the middle camera. Get closer and closer and really have like a nervous breakdown during it. 
and they hadn't taken the broken glass out of the TV set, so I... But it was fine. But you were back at work the next day. But I think it was like 30. It was a tremendous number of stitches. Like, it was real... Yeah. Yeah, real issues. So this movie has, like... It's about sexual abuse and the drug culture and the war hero is horribly killed and, and, and there's no Hollywood ending. How... And it was a musical, a rock opera in 1975, way past the era when that gets done. How did... Uh, how did that movie uh, work? Uh, how did it get? How did it get made? Why do you think it had the sort of lasting power that it does? Why people are still excited to see it tonight? Well, the music is great. Wow. Oh my goodness, the, the Who, you know, Townsend and Daltrey and John and uh, Kevin. Ah, oh, Kevin Moon. Keith, I'm sorry, Keith, Keith Moon. Moon. Yeah. Bless their souls. The, oh, um, my gosh. You followed Pete Townsend around London, right, when you got there. That's like how you spent the, your first half a week or something, just following well, Pete Well, we around. recorded. We recorded immediately. But before that, I had never met Ken. And I came, uh, we went to lunch together, and I'd heard stories about him that he was really volatile. And uh, he must have sensed that... There's no way if a person yells at me, because there never was any yelling in, in our family, ever. Uh, I could never, I, I could never um, continue doing something if somebody you, yelled at me. Is that right? Yes. So directors had to... Well, somehow or another, Ken realized that just from having lunch with me that day. The best directors are intuitive like that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the uh, George Sidney you mentioned as another mentor was he was George intuitive oh in that way? Oh my gosh, he t he taught me so much um, about lighting, about um, really listening to the person that you're talking to in a scene, about clothes and makeup, hair, everything. Oh, bless his soul. Yes, he and Mr. Burns were. In that scene, in, in, uh, the, I think I know the answer to this, it has to be in that scene that we just saw, that wonderful scene and the chemistry between you and, and Elvis is so right. I mean, just in a, I hadn't seen that movie in 12 years, and you can see it right away. When you push him into the pool, that's not, he doesn't go into the pool, right? That's a stunt. It was a stunt man, or did Elvis no, take that time? That no, was Elvis? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, that makes me... That makes me happy somehow. <laughs> no, he deserved it. <laughs> he was always teasing me, and I just teased him right back. Um, just one question about that. You, you write so beautifully about him. That's one thing I was going to read. I just, you're, the parallel careers, that just, it's, that's what strikes me, is that you both sort of, you, were, you could easily have been for all the success you had, you both were kind of oddly lonely. Is that, is that, is that fair to say, you think? That that's what mm. created that friendship? I've never heard anybody say that. Well, it's, it's a good chance it's wrong. <laughs> um, that, 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 that may be why. <laughs> I don't talk about him. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. But the, uh, uh, anyway, anyway the, if, you, if you have a chance to read Anne Margaret's book, and, and, and you should, um, uh, is the, this, she just tells beautiful stories about Elvis and all these people she worked with, and and, and the way you look at these people is so kind and well, honest. He was a pioneer, uh, you know, unbelievable. And oh, any yeah. So let's. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish up because we got to go with because you're going to present a, a George Sidney yes. Award, and it was and it was yes. uh, and it was George who cast you in those first, not your first two movies, but the yes. movies that 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 made you. Um, do you remember quickly how he discovered you, where he saw you? Oh, boy, you've done your homework. Yeah. <laughs> boy, oh, boy. Well, thank you. I, it's fun to do. Like, look, when, I, you're, when you get the chance to interview you, uh, you, you take it seriously. <laughs> I, uh, I'm so thankful. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that boy, very much. Boy, oh, boy. Um, okay. I was engaged at time 
and let's see, we were up in Las Vegas at the Desert Inn, and my fiance at that time did not dance. Uh, it, was, it was during the twist, and the other couple that was with us, he danced, he was a great dancer, so he and I got up on stage, where was it, at the, the Sands maybe, um, and he happened to be in the audience. He happened to be there. And he saw me, you know, with my long orange hair <laughs> and uh, a black jersey dress, short dress and heels, doing the twist. And that's where he saw me and got an idea for Kim McAfee. But I was so different than her. Um, I mean, that night... Uh, and when I heard that he wanted to see me for an interview for Kim McAfee, oh boy, I didn't know what to wear because I found an old rust-colored pleated wool skirt. And I never wear shirts because I get cold. So I had this white shirt and a rust-colored mohair cardigan and flats. I never wear flats. <laughs> so I went in there, and he told me later that he chuckled because he knew what I had looked like that first time, and he knew that it must have been so hard for me to come up with. <laughs> <laughs> and that, from that meeting, so and from that meeting comes eventually Bye Bye Birdie. 